I'm Dave Webb, Shasta Valley RCD. I've been working on fisheries and water quality issues in the Shasta Valley since 1991. Uh, and want to just kind of add to your understanding of the palette of tools and circumstances that we've got to work with in the Shasta Valley, how they've been changing over the last 20 years, and uh, how we might move forward uh, in terms of what kind of a foundation we can count on and what we can build with that. So the Shasta Valley RCD really got involved in, in the water issue and the fish issue starting about 1988. And we've been focused on improving things in the Shasta Valley as a way to mesh the needs of agriculture with the needs of fish ever since then. So there's a couple of things that uh, we probably should touch on just so you have a full understanding of what there is to work with out there. One of the most important and until very recently least understood things was that the Shasta Valley contains what is the largest lahar or cold sorry, and what people do is when they turn to look at there, the mic stays here. Okay, so you can go ahead and do something. Okay. Largest volcanic lahar in the world. So the entire Shasta Valley, what you see here, was a giant mud flow that occurred 380,000 years ago, entirely filling the normal geology in the valley, covering it over with this slurry. That slurry, in turn, has a lot to do with the conditions of the river. Haven't got time to go into the details. Carson will talk about it a little bit, probably. But uh, it's out there. There's a report by Crandall from USGS. Gives you great background on it. Worth checking out. Rainfall. Shasta Valley is a desert. It's a, a rain shadow area protected by the Eddy Mountains and by Mount Shasta. You can see the, the center of the Shasta Valley. We're down to as low as five inches of total precip a year. Evaporation rates are extremely high. Um, 20 inches, excuse me. 20 inches is about the minimum for conifer growth. So you basically you've got a valley that won't support trees. So you don't have the, the timber issues that you get in most coho watersheds. It's very, very different. Ownership. Public lands are primarily high, high ground perimeter. Central portion of the watershed, all private lands, all the areas of important to coho, private lands. A little bit of BLM land down here in the canyon. We, we talked about that a little bit already, uh, about coho usage. But basically, everything we do is going to be private lands oriented. And in the Shasta Valley, because it's a desert, and because people here have to find a way to make a living, irrigation is essential. So this green area is what is irrigated in the Shasta Valley. Most of it with surface water, some of it with a combination of surface water and groundwater, or just groundwater. All of it is sort of part of the whole system. Because you can see a large unmet demand, 56,000 acres currently irrigated, 105,000 acres that could be. So there's not enough water to go around. It's a challenge. Up until about 1988, there was really minimal awareness of the importance of the Shasta River or, or the, the need to be more concerned, more careful for, with fish and water quality issues. And an awful lot of the river kind of looked like this, a system that had been road hard and put away wet for 150 years. Public lands down the canyon really weren't any different. You know, we were all on the same page back then. This was 1983, the year the BLM classified the Shasta Canyon as an area of critical environmental concern. This is the Shasta Canyon 10 years later. Um, see tree growth coming back here, the river splits, there's a side channel there. Major changes taking place starting at the bottom end on the public lands. On the private lands, we're seeing the same thing. So this is the Shasta River below the Wairika Agar Road at River Mile 7. So for 50 plus years, you can find old documents with this picture or a picture just like it on the cover. Look no different. A stretch of the river that had been mined for gravel starting in the 30s, uh, lost what shade it once had, overly wide. By 1997, uh, we fenced it. And by 2011, you can see the channels narrowing. You can see vegetation coming back in, re recapturing fine sediment from upstream. 
much less surface area in the sun. It was all one, on one private ranch. <coughs> Moving upstream, Montague Grenada Road, uh, 1993. Not a bad looking place, but uh, kind of threadbare. 2005, with a fence that's been in place for 10 years, vast change. A lot more young trees starting to come back, shade, narrower channel more habitat complexity, all the kind of things that you're looking for in a stream. Again, all on private land, all by voluntary efforts that uh, worked at the Shasta Valley, working with local landowners and various funding sources. Further upstream, County Road A12. Uh, again, same same thing, you know, normal, normal agricultural practice where you don't realize that Protecting streams is an important consideration. And again, major changes once fencing is in place to protect uh, the ground from the livestock, to give the banks a chance to, to restabilize, let the vegetation grow back in, narrow the channel, and start uh, cooling the water back down again or allowing it to stay cool. And then up uh, Louis Road, uh, property now owned by Nature Conservancy. Again, you can see back in the 97. Kind of threadbare. Uh, bottom photo. It, fencing's been in place for two years. You can see it looks substantially different. Rows of trees here planted on both sides with cages to keep the beavers from eating the trees. Definitely on the path of change. Uh, the we heard from Bill. Big Springs complex area. Uh, Core coho refugia area, what's left in the system. And the Shasta River, because it's a desert, because it's so hot, the cold water is going to have to be where the springs are. And so that, that sort of leaves us with essentially all our eggs in one basket. The red areas are yet to be protected. The green areas are now protected. All of this has been occurring since 2009 and 2010. So big, big change is happening up there where it matters the most. It, it took us a long time to get there, but, but now it's going on. And that's why I think why we're here today. We now have an opportunity. Same comment from the Scott. We have unfilled habitat. We should be putting it back to work, not just leaving it there with no fish in it. So in terms of progress over the last 20 years, uh, approximately 83% of the main stem shaft is now protected from livestock impacts from, from grazing along the banks. Parks Creek, a little further behind, but 49% uh, protected. The Little Shasta, roughly 60% protected, and Wairi Creek 20% protected. So we are continuing to work on fencing. It's not quite the high priority it once was because the main stem Shasta is really the most important right now for the Salmonids we have. Uh, in the areas once they're fenced, we're also working on tree planting. It's not as easy as you might think because there's a lot of soil conditions that are hard. We've got alkali soils and saline soils. We've got areas where uh, the, water, the water drops too fast and it's pretty hard to plant trees where they'll have moisture to their roots without drowning them in the winter because of the changes to the hydrograph. But nevertheless, on the sites that have them, uh, this is a 25-foot stadia rod. These are trees that were planted in 1996. So we can get shade back and the river is small enough, it doesn't take a giant tree to fully shade the stream. And so we, we are now, you know, running forwards Stream banks protected, opportunity to then get trees growing, get shade going, and extend the areas suitable for rearing further and further downstream as that shade builds up. Another factor that has affected fish, particularly adult returns, are the flashboard dams in the system. We had six of them. Uh, we have removed four. We've got two left. They're both in the discussion stage right now. These are, these are dams, in this case, boards will be placed in these two bays in the summertime, back the water up four to six feet, allow it to go down a canal, and then use, be used for irrigation. Obviously, fish passage here isn't too great. And you can see the ponded up water here. Uh, there are places where this pond was 150 feet wide. It tends to gather a lot of heat. So by eliminating the pond, you eliminate a lot of the temperature gain, and you eliminate the fish barrier. 
but you still have to meet the design function that that dam was was providing, which was to provide irrigation water. And so, it means a conversion from a free, if you will, gravity system where you have no no other costs to one where you've got pumping costs. And so we've been able to do that here with the Black Dam. This is roughly River Mile Seven. Next one up, the Arusha Dam, roughly River Mile Eight and a Half. You can see it's same same story. Flashboards here. These are repair areas from where it got blown out in years past. Ponded area. Again, not, no good fish passage there. This is the hole in the ground dam, replaced by the owner. Six feet tall. Uh, when they took it out, they found coho behind it that had been residing there, but would have had a hard time getting out. And depending on when the dam was removed, they would have had a hard time getting in. And the Shasta Water Association Dam. Essentially, they're all the same. Not very tall, not very big, but you somehow have to remove them and still meet their design function. And we've been able to do that, and we've got two left now that we hope to have taken care of before too long. Next focus area, the one we're primarily focusing on right now, is irrigation tailwater, which is the material, the, the excess water that runs back to the stream after you flood irrigated a field. And flood irrigation is the primary method of irrigation in the Shasta Valley, and it inevitably makes some tailwater, and our challenge now is to minimize the amount that it makes and then minimize the impact of whatever's left. We started off with a LIDAR survey of the core of the Shasta Valley, the areas along the streams where tailwater is going to get back to the stream. We prioritized the highest priority areas, coincidentally, same place the coho are using, same place the cold water is. The, the theory is we will start with the cold water, we'll keep it cold, and we'll work downstream and follow the cold water down uh, to the lower priority areas so that uh, their tailwater too will not be raising water temperatures. So this is well underway. We've got projects uh, going in on the ground, and we'll continue until we have address the water quality problems resulting from the tailwater. The final turning point was really the purchase of the Big Springs Ranch by Nature Conservancy. The work we'd done further downstream was essential, and that purchase wouldn't have happened if we hadn't been there, but it provides us with this anchor that we can rely on of having the largest spring feeding the stream in hands where the primary goal is not to make a living, but to protect the resource for cold water and for fish. And that gives us a foundation that we can then count on so that all the rest of the work in the river is going to be reliably supported at the very base. So the conclusions. The conditions that were present in the 80s and early 90s, that was then and this is now. They aren't the same anymore. This river is changing. It is now on an improving trajectory. And we've got core areas of coho habitat that are not being utilized. And I think that is, is sort of the reason why we're here. That's what we need to recognize and build on is we're moving forwards, we're not looking backwards. Thank you. Let's thank Dave. <laughs> Another very crisp presentation. We have, we have time for some questions of Dave. He's got a question. Yes. This is Eric Loudenslager again. I was curious about um, chemicals in the irrigation return water and whether there's concerns about potential effects of those on coho. Yes, Eric. Uh, any agricultural area, and actually in truth, any place people have lawns or gardens, you're going to find pesticide use, herbicide use, both of which can have an impact. One of the blessings, if that's the proper word, of the Shasta Valley is that most people out there, because of the climate, because of the soils, because of the distance to market, are growing a very low value crop. It's grass hay and grass pasture. You can't afford to put much on it by way of pesticides or herbicides. It's too expensive and it doesn't pay off. The net result is we don't seem to have, and, and what water testing has been done over the years doesn't seem to be turning up pesticide residues, herbicide residues in the stream itself. So while they are used, they aren't used extensively. It's not like other agricultural areas where the crop will support heavy use of chemicals. 
And so we don't seem to have a problem with it. Uh, doesn't mean people aren't needing to be careful, and they are, but, but there doesn't seem to be a problem. Who else got a question for Dave? Dave, <clears throat> great presentation, and I know that you yourself have worked tirelessly uh, with the landowners, with the agencies to try to figure this stuff out. And uh, you've just shown us such great success. And you know, one of the keys to restoration and conservation is landowner cooperation. And so my question is related to that. Uh, all, it's almost all fenced now. Uh, the, the flashboard dams and the Shasta, I think they're, they're all out or nearly out. Um, there's extra costs when you remove those dams from maintaining the fish screens, from the increase in electricity. <clears throat> when you put in fences, that means part of that private land is no longer available uh, for grazing. The tailwater um, uh, issues you're dealing with. I, my question's related to gaining landowner cooperation even though they're needing to change their practices, it's costing them more. How did you gain that? What would you do? Because we need it still. It was, it was a long and slow process. A lot of it, I think, was because the RCD chose to recognize it as an issue. And the RCD board members were able to sort of provide the entree to the community saying, we think this is important for you to consider. That was way back in the 90s. Um, that got us started. And a lot of people out there that, that whose, whose, own, whose property does border the river do care about it a lot. But things like fencing along the river, you've got to kind of pencil it out. If it's going to get buried by debris every time there's a high water or washed out, there's a maintenance cost there, and you just can't justify it on your own. So, so the combination of personal commitments backed up by public funding that, that would allow you to build a fence where you wouldn't build it yourself because you know it would periodically get ruined. That helped. Um, slowly changing over time, what was once a radical idea became the norm as more and more people did it and so it became less socially constrained. And, and that took patience. It also took vision on the part of the people funding projects to recognize that, well, this project might be in the lower end of the river where it's less important, but someday it'll matter. We'll fund it because we can, realizing that over time we're going to work our way upstream to where it gets increasingly important. And so it be, it's a matter of recognizing you have to be a little bit opp opportunistic when you're working on private lands. Do what you can do, where you can do it, when you can do it, and not say, I want to see everything happen in the proper sequence. I want to start where it's best and protect it, and then the second best, and third best, and fourth best, because you may not have that opportunity for another 20 years, which is exactly what we encountered here. And sometimes, you know, that dirty word, occasionally enforcement, can make a big difference too. That there's got to be a proper mix. If, if, if people are moving in the right direction, you give them a chance to acclimate, to, to adjust, to, to rethink, and occasionally you, you aren't allowed to. So it, it's, it's a little bit of everything, but mostly I think it's a clear-eyed, long-range view that there's no simple answers here and everybody out there is different and they've got their own motivations and you've got to work with them one-on-one -on -one and meet their needs in the process of meeting your own. We've got a question back here for Dave. Um, I'm Sari Sommerstrom with the Scott River Water Trust. Uh, Dave, great context over the history. I just loved it. One of the issues that both the Scott and Shasta are dealing with right now is the issue with beaver and coho habitat. And I was just wondering if you could give a quick overview on what you feel the status of beaver is in the Shasta and what efforts are being made to try to uh, recover some beaver. There's been a few times when I've been floating stretches of the Shasta River in a canoe and found myself having underestimated how long it will take. It's a, a terribly meandering stream. It, it looks like if you fly over the Mississippi at 10,000 feet, it looks just like the Shasta River at 500 feet. It, it is wiggly. And, and it can take you forever to go what looks on a map like a fairly short distance. So you find yourself there after dark. And after dark, the beavers are out, and you will scare a beaver about every quarter mile. And he'll slap his tail and dive, or you'll see him on the bank looking at you, wondering what you're doing in his territory. There are a lot of beaver on the Shasta River, even though there's very little by way of woody material for them to eat. They make do with herbaceous materials. Uh, my 
sort of coarse observation is that beavers don't build dams if the water is more than about a foot and a half deep. They, they're safe enough, they're underwater, they can burrow into the banks and have their tunnels under there. Why work? And so it's only when the streams get shallow, they then build dams to give themselves the ponds to work in. And in the Shasta, at least, I think we've got a large enough base population, and they're productive enough, that they're going to recolonize any place they can as long as there's enough water there to keep them underwater so the coyotes or the bobcats don't eat them. Um, and in truth, right now, from my perspective, they're more of a problem than a help because they're so hard to get ahead of when it comes to planting trees to recapture shade. We don't have natural recruitment of trees, and you can't plant as many trees as they can eat in a night. It's just, you can't do it. So every, every tree we plant has a cage around it. Uh, different systems are going to be different. But beavers are productive enough, if they're present at all, and you're not continuously trapping them as was occurring back in, before the 20s, they will, I think, repopulate on their own once the habitat's suitable. That's my personal guess. Thanks. Um, I'll take another question in just a minute. I, I did want to remind folks, or actually tell people, because you probably don't know this, in addition to all the other things that the RCD is, is doing, working with you, helping sponsor this, this meeting, they are going to, their website is going to be hosting the presentations. And then also, um, as you probably figured out, we are having this recorded, both audio and video. And it's my understanding that as soon as we can make that possible, that will also be up on the RCD website. So it's available for, for all of you um, or for folks who haven't, uh, weren't able to come today. We've got another question. Yes. I'll, I'll get to the mic. And again, introduce yourself, Mike. My name is Michael Banks, and I visit from Oregon, where I, I live on the Salets River. And I'm just intrigued. We have a farm there where we have a creek that we've tried to build riparian habitat. I tried three times. We have lots of beavers. Uh, OWEB then came and supported the effort and did a much better job than me. And I've been very fascinated, though, that uh, what another big uh, impact is made by Rodents, do you have that issue there? I mean, there are hundreds of rodents that eat these trees very effectively, too. Yeah, what, what, what I found in our tree planting was the beavers <laughs> like the larger willow species. So the red willow, the arroyo willow, the black willow, uh, or excuse me, not, not the arroyo willow, the, um, uh, there's another willow. Uh, they, they like the largest willows most. They like cottonwoods more than that. Um, the deer really like to eat the alders. The bulls like to girdle the water birch. Um, it's a jungle out there. <laughs> <laughs> so we wind up putting cages that'll keep the beavers off. And it was interesting, the beavers were pretty dumb for about the first 15 years. You give them a three foot cage and they're baffled. They've learned, they now climb our cages and they will be poking their heads down in and they'll eat things down as deep as they can go in the cage. Um, those, those mesh nets like they used to use out in the woods around conifers, they do a good job on the mice. The, the, the mice will leave the trees alone. They won't girdle them anymore if you put those on. Um, we notice the voles like to make hay in the caged areas around each tree. They'd be cutting grass and piling it up in there and, and drying it. So, and once they're there, I guess they get bored and they got to chew on the tree bark. But there's no easy out. I mean, if you don't have a, a stream that naturally floods and has big flood plains and, and you can grow things from seed, in place, you're going to struggle. It's going to be expensive and you'll have failures. In the Shasta, we've got a nice high water table. That helps a lot, but it also means that a lot of our soils are kind of anaerobic in areas you think you could grow trees, you have an awful hard time getting any kind of root growth at all out of them because of the anaerobic soil conditions or the alkali soils or the saline soils. So it, it takes a real site specific approach, I think, but, but the rodents will get you. Dave, we have another question for you um, back here. I'll make it quick. Um, just one quick comment on the beavers. We noticed that they, the alders, they don't seem to like to eat the alders. No, they don't. And then the, my main question, on the Shasta River with the, the low gradient springs that seem to be the headwaters, where do you get your spawning gravel? Do you have to augment the spawning gravel? Uh, I mentioned that volcanic debris flow. 
which filled the whole Shasta Valley with muck, basically. And those hills, that if you head south, those hills you drive through when you get by the weed rest area, those came down as intact floating islands in the mud. So they, they, they're like icebergs. So what's out there doesn't have a very high gravel content. And because that debris flow, it acts much like a reservoir would act. It's flat. There's no, no gradient to it. Coarse materials from the hills don't get transported across it very well. So we don't have what you would call a source of gravel feeding the system like you do on the Scott, where it's, it's all been formed by alluvial processes of water running downhill, ramping itself out from the hills, and carrying gravel with us. There hasn't been time for that to redevelop. And so what gravel we've got out there tends to be what's left behind when erosion winnows out the fines and leaves what rocks were in the soil matrix left behind. And that's the bulk of it. And perhaps some, some relic glacial deposits that got plowed up with that debris flow and, and get uncovered again. But gravel in the Shasta River is in naturally short supply and places where it was found frequently were mined for gravel. As that picture I showed you of, of the first dam we removed, that was that area had been, you know, a drag line had been brought in there back in the 30s, and they would periodically mine gravel because it accumulated there, and used it for the sidewalks and the foundations all over Wairika and the Shasta Valley. We've got time for another question for, for Dave. Don Meamber again. I've worked with Dave for long time on the river and we've had a lot of discussions about what works and what doesn't work and I want to say something about the beavers uh, I'm out, out in the middle of the valley Dave showed some pictures of my place on the before and after the ones that had a lot of the big old red willows on it and and I know I got beavers there but th there's never been any sign of a beaver dam on anything I've seen and Dave talks about how they, they just need some deep water and I have the DWR weir on my property. It's uh, Shasta River near Montague is the is the gauging station there. And one problem the beaver creates is uh, there's a pressure transducer measuring device, and and the air bubbles come up out of the ground and in the through the water, and and the beaver likes to pack mud and trash over the top of it, and then. The, uh, USGS has taken care of that for the last few years, and they and they notice on their on the when they go online that the the graph goes crazy. It looks like you just had an earthquake, and it's because the air can't is having a hard time escaping out of the water because of all the debris there. And um, Dave, you talked about the the needing to need a lot of willows to to uh, supply the beavers. I know it's on the picture earlier picture of the. I think uh, Bill had it uh, of the beaver dam on the upper Shasta River. Um, looks like a beaver dam that I have on the Oregon Slough. It's it's more looks like old dead red willow driftwood more than cuttings from the fresh cuttings of new growth. And and I on the Oregon Slough where that dam is, it's it's a, it's right near a great big arroyo willow. It's got a probably got a million shoots on it. Nature Conservancy has been out with Amy and, and Chris and Ada have come out and cut, making cuttings to plant on the neighbor, Nature Conservancy property on the on Big Springs Creek. And and with all those, all that supply, unlimited supply for the beavers to build the dam out, they're still still using old dead uh, driftwood or de dead limbs that picked off the ground. It doesn't have to be new new growth that they, they use to build a dam out of. And uh, another comment is uh, the lady up in front was talking about the fencing the stream and taking the land out of production. Dave and I have talked about this too. I've noticed on the property downstream of the, the weir, uh, since we fenced and the river started to close up, that uh, there's a kind of a low area in the field that between irrigations, it would always dry out through there. But once it was fenced and the water, the water, it was, during the late summer when the river was low too, and when I drive down through there, the it would always stay muddy and sometimes a little bit of water standing there. And I'm sure it's like the water table is raised. And, and, I, and Dave's commented on certain places on the river that that probably were sub-irrigated from the river and in more modern times they had to irrigate it and probably wouldn't have had to years ago when the 
before the uh, river was lost its uh, natural state where, where it was the river has actually downcut a little bit in places. Although we have uh, hard pan in the, in the soil in the, throughout the Shasta Valley so that kind of serves as a bottom floor that keeps the river from downcutting like it does on, say, the Scott River or Wire Creek Creek is downcut, but uh, Shasta River reaches a point, but it's still too low to, to sub-irrigate the fields. But on my property that my sister now has, it's, it's, uh, it showed the effects of, of, uh, of reclamation by fencing is you actually improve the land uh, out from the stream because of water table raising. So it's, it's not all lost by, by fencing. And you're not just losing all that land for grazing. You're actually improving some of the land beyond the, the fence. So just want to make that point. Don, those are great, great comments. I really Thank appreciate them. Thank you. OK, we're going to um, keep moving then and uh, move on to our next panel. So let's thank Dave for all his work and all his wisdom.